just to send you a couple of slides how to program this thing that we call industry and spy. Um, this is the aforementioned legal slide. We will go over it, and it also says other brands and names of property and so forth. Um, okay, this is one that, what I wanted to go through. Uh, first, uh, native programming, uh, and then the two offload models that we support for, for Mike at the moment. Uh, one question, who of you already used the Intel compiler or Intel composer XP? Okay, that's 90%. Those remain the same percent can read the slide, so I will go through that pretty quickly because it's all the same. You know, it's the same architecture, it's the same tool. Everything that works for Xeon works for Xeon Phi, okay? So we can we can basically skip that. So all the all the well known compiler switches for optimization, for vectorization, for aggressive optimization, for debugging, for getting the assembly code, for open MP support, for report generation, optimization reports and vectorization reports. Everything is exactly the same, okay? That's important to understand. Um, and you can basically read the manual or read those slides to get the most important one. Yeah. Okay, and then, you know, this, this is probably the most important. Um, so probably the most important part of, of those slides is this particular switch. Dash and mic to tell the Intel compiler to actually generate code for, for the mic architecture. For the Okay, um, and since vectorization and optimization is key to performance, in particular on mic, um, so we have all those switches to tell the compiler. Um, James already elaborated on that. Um, we have an aliasing problem typically in in, in C, where the compiler cannot figure out if there's an alias or not. Uh, so we have various means to to get rid of that, like you're only doing anti-aliasing rules or you don't have alias, or you're using the restrict keyword in C99. Um, important, you can have assume dummy alias. So all those, you know, switches to treat or tell the compiler how to get rid of aliases, or if there are aliases are present as well, you should use them to get more knowledge to the compiler um, to get a better, better chance of actualization. Then also particularly important, and I heard a, a, a talk at, at ISC that said one of the most important features of a compiler is reporting because then you, can know, then you will know and you can figure out what went wrong with your code in terms of compilation. So why didn't it, didn't it optimize or why didn't the compiler vectorize? And so those are, are very important for Mike as well. Um, since th those switches tell you what the compiler did to your code and what happened, and what you can expect in terms of, of the generated code. And, you know, I will not go through all of them, but basically you can tell the compiler uh, to emit almost anything it did to your program. Um, like, for example, you can ask the compiler to get uh, information out of your program in terms of loop unrolling, uh, loop distribution, loop fusion, vectorization, and all the optimization services that we have to in our compiler. And so you should turn on uh, those features to see if the hotspotting application, so the part of the program that consumes most of the runtime, is actually optimized well for the for a particular platform. Okay, that could look like this, for example. So it tells you that there has been a loop; it has been unrolled and changed by a factor of four. So this loop has been vectorized, for example. Okay, that's about it about compiler. Um, now let's talk about the the explicit offload model. James already said uh, that this is kind of comparable to what CUDA and OpenCL does. So this is our way of uh, handling mic as a coprocessor and not as a full compute node. Um, so you have a host part of the application and you have a C on Phi or mic part of the application where you actually offload code to for execution. Okay, so you identify a kernel and you offload that. Um, <clears throat> We have two, two different ways. We have offload partners, or C, C++, and Fortran. And we have an explicit offload syntax with keywords, which is only applicable to C and, uh, and C++. Okay, and we will go through those. The important thing to understand, though, is um, offloading and parallelization in our model are orthogonal to each other. 
Um, if you recall the same slide about the, all the programming models that we support for, for C on 5, uh, you can imagine that tying the offloading to those type of programming models would be a nightmare. You would have an offloaded version for CDV, offloaded version for CIRF, offloaded version for OpenMP, p offloading, what else? MPI offloading, 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 offloading. So each parallel programming model would have its own, own offloading capability. And so what we did is we have an offload model, and this model just offloads whatever code you have. Okay, and then you need a second programming model to actually create the parallelism on the device. Okay, that's important to understand. Okay, syntax, it's kind of easy. Um, so we have this Pragma or a directive in, in Fortran that basically says Pragma offload and the target should be might. That's about it. Okay, and then we have some clauses, additional clauses, where you can aid the compiler in figuring out what actually to do, like data transfers or asynchronous offloading or synchronous offloading. So you can further control what the offloading actually does. And that's it. The other thing we have is so-called implicit offloading model. Um, in this model, you just tell the compiler which data is shared between the host and the, and the code processor. And you tell the compiler to, let's say, for example, split shared, tells the compiler that this true variable is both present on the host and the mic. And then you get another keyword to actually offload a function call or a region of code to the device. It uses the third curse keyword because underscore shared is already used for Microsoft. And if you want to support Windows, you need to get rid of this name class. And so the decision was uh, to add it, uh, to add third to it. Although it's not coupled with third, uh, it's kind of in the same name set. So you don't need to use third parallelization to actually make use of that. Okay, and yeah, and somebody automatically maintains coherence between your data, so you just share it, and somebody else, the runtime system, will take care that the most recent version of your data is available wherever it is in this. Okay? Okay, now a little bit of syntax. You're going to need that um, in the lab exercises that I've prepared. Um, so the first thing is Pragma offload, then a set of clauses, and then we have a standard statement block. A uh, statement block is either a single statement in C or something uh, in curly braces. Um, and we have a function attribute that you can add to functions that you want to call from an offload list. Okay? Um, it's kind of cumbersome to add that to, you know, 500 or 1,000 functions. So what you can do is you have also programs to push and pop the function attribute uh, to the compilation stack. And so with Pragma push, uh, you basically enable this attribute for all global object functions, static variables, whatever, that follow the statement until you say uh, the offload attribute pop. Okay, so you can flag a whole section of code uh, to be compiled for offloading. The other thing that's not on the slide, we also have a compiler flag to enable support for offloading for a whole um, compilation unit. And the reason why we, why we need this attribute is we want to support libraries and shared libraries. Um, so we need to tell the compiler to prepare a for both execution on the host and on the mic um, through, those, through, through those attributes, since the compiler cannot figure it out. So. Okay, so we have this directive in Fortran. Um, I, talk, I talked, in my, one of the previous slides, I talked about the offload model being orthogonal to, to the parallelization. This was a lie, at least for Fortran. Um, because in Fortran, the only true parallelization model that we have at the moment of Coherate Fortran is there, let's put it this way, um, is open and key. And so in Fortran, we made this exception that the offloading stuff is tied to the open and key uh, namespace and to the open and key program. But basically, it's the same, so directives, Open and key offload, and then the same with an open and key construct following, or a single statement uh, like a procedure call or whatever um, could be done as well. And also the attributes to offload or to mark modules and functions, procedures um, as offloaders. 
offloadable. Okay, in code, this looks like that. So on the left, we have a C example. If you add Pragma offload target mic to a loop, guess what? You're offloading a sequential version of that loop to the code process. Okay, if you want to have that running in parallel, you would add, in this case, something like open and see parallel forward to tell the compiler to also parallelize the loop. If you don't do it, you get sequential code. Okay? Easy, isn't it? Fortran, the same basically. If you offload something like your calls to the routine procedure, it gets sequential code on the code processor. If you want to parallelize the code, please add an open and key parallel statement to the offload pragma to tell the compiler, hey, this loop should be parallelized with execute and so on. Okay? Um, so this is the source code with pragma added. And this is what happens. Um, to your code internally. So this is kind of a high-level description of the, what the compiler does to your code. Um, so in the main routine, you basically check, is there a mic? And if yes, please initialize the mic. Okay. Then we jump into this F function. And at the end of your application, we basically tell the mic to shut down and to unload whatever we sent in. Okay. Next up, we compile the F function. So for the compiler from this pragma creates a statement that says, if there is a mic available and ready to take on some work, um, then we are going to send data to the mic. We will invoke um, a special version of that particular code that you flagged with the upload pragma, um, send it to the mic, and execute it there. In former times, this has been called the remote procedure call. Nowadays, we call it offloading um, because it's kind of a new concept, but you can see it as a remote procedure call that the host sends to a remote process on the, on the code processor to execute this fraction of the code. Okay? And when the code is finished, you basically receive all data that, we, that the code generates on the, on the code processor back to the host. Okay? And if there is no mic, we just execute. Um, the code in a standard way. Okay, so for each upload pragma, basically what the compiler does is it creates a code path running on the host only, and the code path running also on the code processor, and depending on whether the code processor is present or not, it will choose either one. Okay? Okay, and then this G function, um, which we call from the offload, uh, it could be in a different, different source file. So we added this attribute target mic, to tell the compiler to create a standard version of G for execution on the on the Xeon host and a G mic uh, working on uh, the code processor. Okay. Okay. I talked about a lot of clauses that you can specify, and basically the compiler tries to do the right thing for the compiler's definition of right. Okay, so sometimes the compiler is not smart enough to figure something out. Uh, so the first thing that you obviously need to specify almost always is where you want to actually put the code to. So in this case, it's target mic. And we left a, you know, um, placeholder there um, to support also something like reverse uploading or probably it's future to something else. Okay, whatever that else may be. And in terms of, of Xeon file, you can specify a card number. So in case you always want to hit the same coprocessor card, the same specific coprocessor card, you can attach an integer ID to make sure that this coprocessor is, is used. So for example, if you upload data to it, um, you should need at the next offload go to some other card, right? Uh, so that's, uh, that's why we have it. Then we have in, out, and in, out. Um, so the compiler tries to figure out what data transference needs to be done, but sometimes it cannot tell. And in this case, you need to specify in to transfer data from the host to the, the coprocessor, out to transfer data back, or in out to transfer to the coprocessor and back after. Okay. Um, no copy means don't copy anything. The data is probably already present or is allocated on on the coprocessor by the offload region. So don't copy anything over. 
Okay. Then we have this if condition. Um, so sometimes offloading doesn't pay off when the data size is too small. So you can have any if condition um, to basically tell the compiler or the runtime system to avoid the offloading if the data size is too small or if the input is not 42 or something else. And then we have support for async offload. Uh, so this is all blocking. So whenever you fire up a, a offload, the host application or the host thread will stop working until the offload has been completed. And with signal, it indicates to the compiler that this should be an async class offload, and to detect completion of this particular offload, it provides a so-called signal slot. Uh, that's basically just a number. It could be one or a pointer to the local stack or anything. It's just, you know, some identification for this offload. And so you have this wait clause here to wait for a certain signal. Okay? Um, you don't necessarily need to do that. Um, if you already got an open and key host application that uses tasking, for example, because you could just simply have an open and key task that does the offload. Okay, and you know, have a couple of threads working or a few blocks in, in this offload. So you've got many options here, depending on what, whatever you're coding at. Okay, um, then as James already also said, you took away almost all my talking. Do you know that? Uh, <laughs> yes. Okay. Speed up. Speed up. Faster. Faster. Okay. Pointers are evil. C doesn't have C doesn't have true arrays. They only have pointers with pointer arithmetic. Um, so the compiler typically doesn't know how long an array is. And so in this case, the compiler will not be able to figure that out at any time. Um, so you can specify the length of the data behind the pointer. Okay. That you can add to. Uh, to the clauses. Alloc is, that's also something you will need for the lab. Um, you can tell the compiler to allocate something on the mic when the, when the condition evaluates the truth, and then keep it there. Okay? And with three if, you can get rid of this data again. Okay, so typical <laughs> offload would be one offload statement with an in clause and alloc is true to copy the data over to the mic and keep it there. Then you do a couple of other offloads and you work on the data and the final offload does an odd clause with three is to tell the mic uh, to release the data. Okay? And of course you can change the alignment during transfer uh, to suit the alignment requirements of the mic. Okay, this is an example um, how you can offload a pointer. So you say in, so from host to mic, uh, you copy data and the length is number off. And it's the number of elements because at least that the compiler can do it is smart enough to figure out the data size of the particular type you're concerned. And you can only copy things that are bitwise copyable. That's the compiler term. And bitwise copyable means no pointers, only plain old data types like flat arrays, uh, multidimensional arrays if they are not like Java arrays, reference arrays, and then data arrays, or C++ options. That doesn't work. Okay, so plain old data types that you can basically stick into memcop. Okay, nothing fancy. Okay, and this is what happens. So when you when you write in out, um, we first allocate some space on the mic. We transfer the data from the host memory to the mic memory. Um, we execute the code that you specify in the offload region, and then at the end we copy back the data that you specified, and finally, um, we switch the local memory. Okay? This is how you would do it, and this is how we did it. Okay, implicit offloading. So the idea here is the main problem for, for non-copyable um, structures is pointers. And so if you can make sure that, you know, the pointer is valid on both sides of the PCI Express bus, you could basically just copy over a pointer. Okay, and that's, that's what we do in the implicit offload model. So since we have a 64-bit address space on either side of the express, PCI Express bus, we can basically memory map um, memory wherever we like. Okay, and specifically we can memory map those physical pages at the same addresses on both the host and all the C on Phi co Okay, and so this is what we do in this in this in this particular model. So we have 
a certain amount of memory that is mapped on the host memory, and we have the same, roughly the same amount of, main, of memory that is um, allocated on the night corner in, in our case today. And we make sure that, the, that they are using the same physical address. And so whenever something points in here, it will also be valid over there. Okay? And then there is somebody on the, on the low level. It's called a distributed shared memory system or virtual shared memory or shared memory emulation, however you may call it. Um, since it's out there for 30 years now, um, there are so many different, different ways to express it, but essentially there's a runtime system that keeps track of the changes to the host memory and to the change in memory and makes sure that those changes are synchronized on a page level. That's about it. Okay, so we have right now eight gigabytes on the KMC card. This can be basically be as large as, as you want, 32 gigabytes, 64 gigabytes, a terabyte, whatever. And we will make sure that the pages are swapped in and swapped out to the KMC memory automatically. Yes? Yeah? Okay, it's done on, a, on page granularity, so full K. And so you get kind of four shares. So you got one variable at the beginning of the page, the other one at the end. And you know the, the host touches the first variable, the, the, the KMC touches the second, what happens to the page? And the answer to that is that we create, internally we create a twin, or that's usually how it's done. We create a twin of the page. Okay, we keep the original page, page as it was since first in the page, first place. Then we change it and we update it. And then we send back the, cha the, the changes to the owner. We compare those, the twin and the updated page, and only since the difference. Okay, and on the other side, we only apply the difference. Like an automatic patch, source code stuff. Okay, and this makes sure that non-overlapping data is also not changed when you, when you exchange a page. Okay, and if you change the same memory address, you get a race condition, and that's the real problem. Okay, now you need to make sure that the data is in the right in the right space, and this is how it works. So we have new versions of malloc and free uh, to basic, basically tell your application or the runtime system to allocate the bunch of data that you're currently allocating in the right spot. Okay, nobody is screaming at me. Ooh, I need to rewrite my code because I got so many malloc. No, damn it. Okay, um, so the, the key thing is malloc is a weak symbol. Okay, so you can simply change it at link time, a dynamic link time, for example, if you want to have all mallocs going to the shared memory or the virtual shared memory, or you can still, you know, change the semantics of malloc through if this or whatever you can implement it yourself. So many of them. Whew. Okay, what else? Um, okay. Um, so who of you remembers cluster opening key from Intel? Okay, so we had a product that did the same thing across cluster nodes to simulate or emulate a virtual shared memory across different cluster nodes, okay? And this really works well if you're not exchanging data all the time, okay? And in this pro programming model, it's the same. All the people that, that I'm talking to say, well, you know, this is so, this is so overheadful. We have so many transfers, we cannot control those transfers. We cannot, we cannot, we cannot. This is almost true. You can simply control it um, by locality, which you need on numerous systems. In, on today's platforms, you need locality anyway. So you don't necessarily want to transfer all the data between your numa nodes. And you do the same in, in this model, and it will perform reasonably well. Okay? At least. You have, a, you have an option because serializing a whole object tree in C++ is also very costly. Okay? And probably this is just faster than your manual serialization of C++. Okay? Could be fast. Okay, I already said that it's, uh, Intel is definitely incorporated into that. It's not actually part of it, so you don't require C++ to, to make use of it. But you know, it kind of blends well with, with the field plus uh, program. We have those, those keywords. Um, so a shared function is a function that exists both on the host and on the coprocessor. 
Uh, then we have this X, which is shared, so X exists on both ends of the PCI Express bus. Then pointers are funny because now you need to know how you reach a declaration in C. So this is a T, which is a pointer, a local pointer, that points to shared data. And the shared data is in, okay, from right to left. This is a P. The P is shared, and oh, by the way, it's a pointer to in. Okay, and it should point to shared data. Okay, so you can put this shared flag wherever it makes sense, like you can put a comp modifier in, in, in C, C++. And yeah, we also have this offload attitude to push a whole series of silk shared modifiers to a whole compilation unit. Okay? Okay, this is how it works. Uh, so you can offload a function, you can offload a function to a certain card number, just as with the partner model. Um, and if you want to do asynchronous offload, and this is why it blends well with Silk Plus, you just say Silk Barn offload function. And that's it. Okay, then a new Silk thread is created that takes care of the offloading. And then at the end, when you need this X, this X you would make a Silk Spawn and wait for the offload to continue. Okay, that's why I said it's, it's, it's really simple. And you can also, of course, offload a whole Silk for statement. Um, to have a silk for parallel loop um, on the uh, on the custom. Or if you don't like silk at all, um, you can basically have in a silk shared function whatever programming model you like. So here I'm you know offloading uh, complete pi to the coprocessor and using OpenMP internally to parallelize that that possibility. Okay? Okay, how to turn on? We introduced a couple of new compiler switches. So the first thing is offload build to tell the compiler to respect the offload fragment and the offload keyword. And then we have a new report space, off uh, report space offload that tells you how much data since what has been off um, compiled for offload and what the compiler thinks the amount of data will be when it is transferred. Okay, so of course, hard to guess. Um, when you have array, but at least it will give you some sense if you're transferring lots of data or not. And for each, um, when you compile, you can have different different options for the host and for the uh, for the C and Pi coprocessor. So you can have compiler flags for C for the C++ compiler that translates the offload code. You can have an archiver. Um, switch for if you want to build an offload library or whatever, um, and also for, for for the linker. So for example, um, a typical command line would look, would look like this. We invoke the Intel compiler on the host. We don't care too much about performance because we are going to work on the mic anyway, so it's too efficient. We want to use the mass kernel library in offload mode and on the, for the code processor, we want maximum optimization level to get vectorization, you know, and whatever optimizations we have. And by the way, here, linker, use the MKL from this particular directory. Okay, so it's highly integrated into the compilation uh, structure, and you will face those um, options in, in the lab access. There is one single note, and this is my true personal note, so I'm not the Intel employee at the moment. Uh, me as a computer scientist, I really like that shit. Okay, Xeon Phi is a cool architecture. It's really fun to play with it, and I hopefully you make. This, I really hope that you make the same experience today when you get the first first hands on. And so we already had a lot of questions. I think it's time for labs. 